Hi everyone, thank you for joining Midland Pulse, where we discuss topics within the self-directed IRA industry in 30 minutes or less. During this session, Matt Calhoun from Midland Trust interviews Paul Moore of Wellings Capital on recession-resistant real estate. Let's get started. The stock market can be a roller coaster, one that not only makes your stomach drop, but your hard-earned cash drop as well. Midland Trust has your ticket to self-direction that allows you to diversify your retirement portfolio into alternative assets outside of traditional stocks and bonds. Once on the self-directed IRA train, you're the conductor, and you can choose to stop and invest in real estate, hard money lending, futures and forex, private equity, as well as many more alternative investments. All gains grow inside the account tax-free. Investing with a self-directed IRA is easy. You can get off of the stock market roller coaster at any time by making a full or partial tax-free transfer to a Midland self-directed IRA. Then you choose your own investment and let Midland Trust take you on a new investment ride. For information on how to self-direct your retirement funds, visit www.midlandtrust.com forward slash diversify or call 239-333-1032. Hello everyone, Matt Calhoun with Midland Trust. Thanks for joining me on today's Midland Pulse session as today we discuss recession resistant real estate with Paul Moore. Uh, Paul, thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Thanks, Matt. A uh, little bit about Paul. Paul is the co-host of two podcasts, including The Art of Investing and How to Lose Money. Uh, he is a contributor on Fox Business and Bigger Pockets. Uh, Paul has also authored books, including The Perfect Investment, Creating Enduring Wealth from Historic Shift to Multifamily Housing, uh, Storing Up Profits, Capitalize on Americans' Obsession with Stuff by Investing in Self-Storage. Um, Paul is also the managing director of three commercial real estate funds uh, with Wellings Capital. To uh, add a little context to today's conversation, uh, right now we're in mid-August, um, the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic um, stock market we've seen go down, up, kind of bounce around. Um, I don't know how your conversations daily go, but with our clients, it's a lot of, I want to diversify out of a stock market. I don't know what's happening. We still have double digit uh, unemployment rates right now. And everyone's kind of a little worried that we may be in a prolonged recession. Um, which brought us perfect to have Paul on and talk about uh, recession-resistant real estate today. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 it, it's been a crazy time, and what, you know when the stock market dropped like it did, I think it was the last week in February. I had you know really surprised that it came back as roaring, you know, roaring back like it did, and I was actually predicting uh, housing, you know, the housing, the residential housing market would start to drop this summer too, and who would have thought it would just keep going mm -hmm. uh, in, in the bull seller's market that it is? I mean, I guess it's helping places like Philadelphia that, you know, for, I've, I've heard, though I haven't personally verified, that over 400,000 people have moved out of New York City in six months. So, yeah, yeah crazy time. It is, and it'd be nice to know where we're at on the uh, econ economic uh, track, but we don't know if it's past us or if we're <laughs> still waiting for you know, the bubble to burst, who knows? It feels a little bit like December 2007 when we, you know, we were hoping the worst was over, but of course had no idea what was about to hit us and how much worse it was really going to get. But uh, yeah. hopefully, you know, hopefully this time it'll go better, though there's a lot of people who I really respect, like Ray Dalio and uh, Howard Marks, who are storing up cash to... Um, you know, to look for distressed assets and distressed debt. They're pretty smart guys. So I'm kind of, you know, thinking the same way right now, trying to follow their lead. And kind of bring into our topic today. Um, when I hear a lot about diversification or maybe pulling some of those, now that my, my portfolio is back to kind of where it was February-ish, um, now I want to diversify some of those assets. What would you consider to be really recession resistant uh, real estate? What kind of asset classes does that include? <laughs> Yeah. So for a lot of reasons I, I can detail, I really like self-storage and mobile home parks, and we invest in those at Wellings Capital. <clears throat> I also like apartments uh, with some caveats. 
and uh, we invest in though we invest in apartments at Wellings Capital. Though we haven't found any deals that make sense for years because of their their extremely overheated. Uh, a couple asset classes we don't, or asset types we don't invest in, are uh, cell towers and data centers. I think they make a lot of sense. And of course, right now, anything logistic oriented, we invested in a self storage facility in Colorado Springs that had a huge logistics, basically warehouse component, and it's going really well. So um, those are some of the ones that I see, Matt, that make a lot of sense. If, and if you wouldn't mind maybe talking about at least one or two of those and what do you really like about those and what really makes them resistant to some of the other market fluctuations? Yeah. I'll talk about the two I know best. Um, self storage. The um, the tenants are really sticky. I mean, think about it. Um, if if I'm renting a thousand dollar apartment and my landlord says I'm raising your rent by six percent, I'm thinking, okay, rather than pay sixty dollars extra a month and get locked in for a whole year, I might just move. But if I'm renting a self-storage facility and the landlord says I'm raising at 6%, well, I'm probably not going to take a Saturday, rent a U-Haul, get my friends together, and move all my stuff down the street to save 6 bucks a month, especially when I'm on a month-to-month -month lease. And I'm thinking, yeah, as soon as I can get a couple days off, I'm going to clear out that place anyway. And a lot of tenants think that way. There's a huge difference between... Uh, tenant intention and tenant reality. And so tenants are really sticky. A second thing I like is the fact that self-storage has performed really well in good and bad markets. In good markets, people are filling up their Amazon and Walmart carts and they need a place to store their stuff. A lot of baby boomers, unfortunately, parents are passing away and we need a place to store their stuff. Um, in bad times, though, a lot of people, you know, in 20, 2008 or so, they downsize maybe from a 4,000 to a 2,000 square foot home or from a 2,000 to an apartment. And when they downsized for a small amount of money, they could store their stuff. And people stored their stuff for years. Some people still have the same storage unit that they got back then that they could have paid for many times over by just liquidating. But at any rate, um, another thing I like is the, uh, the, it's easier to evict. You're not evicting a person. You're not getting the court sympathy uh, of a person you're evicting. Basically, the tenant's lease is collateralized by their stuff. And so I like that in good and bad times. We've actually seen during COVID so far, uh, occupancies up, delinquencies are down. And uh, we're not seeing a huge, a lot of revenue increases across the board, but we are seeing that, you know, things are going pretty much as expected uh, with, um, you know, as we said in the last recession. Now, mobile home parks, they're the only asset type we know of that has a shrinking supply and an increase in demand every year, Matt. Uh, there's uh, 44,000 mobile home parks in the U.S., we believe, uh, 10 uh, percent might be owned by corporations, the other 90 percent by mom and pops. A lot of those folks are getting old or they are they really would like to sell. And so there's a lot of mom and pop sellers as there are in self-storage, which is why I like these better than the cell towers and data centers. You don't have mom and pop sellers on average. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, tenants are also very sticky. About 95 percent of mobile homes are not mobile. They land somewhere when they're brand new or when they're, you know, just, you know, pretty much uh, when they're originally placed at a mobile home park and they never leave 95% of the time because it's about a $5,000 exercise to pick it up and move it and then put a new deck on, put new skirting on, new electrical, water, sewer connections, etc. So a person paying 300 bucks a month in lot rent typically won't spend 5,000 to move because they're mad at the manager or because their rent goes up by 5%. And so tenants are very sticky there as well. It's the bottom of the housing barrel. And so when people are downsizing, they're sometimes, not, off, not all the time, but sometimes if they're leaving an apartment they can't afford, they'll be looking for a mobile home. In fact, 
uh, we are we have lots of stories in the last five months of mobile home parks with their phones ringing off the hook, people looking for a place to stay. And, and so it's uh, it's actually doing very, very well during the recession. Great. Yeah. And I have a question, so I'll maybe touch on a little bit. We talked about the uh, shrinking supply on the mobile home side. Um, just kind of want to touch on it. So obviously, I think we're catching up to our, because we didn't build anything during the last recession. Right. And now we've been building a lot. Um, but I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, the reason the supply is shrinking is zoning, right? A lot of, There's just not a lot yeah. of zoning for multifamily or mobile homes. Yeah, no, it's called uh, NIMBYism, not in my backyardism. <laughs> And uh, so the individuals don't want a new mobile home park near them, number one. Number two, governments don't want it because often it comes with a large load of, you know, road maintenance, schools, you know, kids going to school, et cetera, but pays extremely low property taxes. So it's really uh, not good for the government. Uh, third, it's not good for developers, and that may surprise you. But developers, I mean, it's not like an apartment you can lease up or self-storage you can lease up 3 to 5 to 7% a month. Uh, if you've got a 100-lot mobile home park brand new, I mean, for the same reason I mentioned earlier, it's not, it's not like you're going to be able to bring in 100 new homes and lease them out tomorrow. It's going to take a long, long time to get to break even. And so for those three reasons, there's just effectively very few you could almost really say no new mobile home parks being built. And we touched on a little bit with the uh, demographic changes in the baby boomers and increasing demand for storage. And I would assume probably mobile home also. Is there anything you see on the horizon that's going to help out the uh, both sectors as well demographically? Yeah. So one thing I like about, uh, you know, apartments and mobile home parks is you can look at demographics decades down the road. And so I was really surprised to find out that uh, Gen Z has the same number of people, number of uh, young people as millennials, about 77 to 80 million. And that's been debated. So I've seen different stats on that. Some say higher. And so uh, with their propensity to not save a whole lot of money and their propensity to have a lot of school debt, uh, we really do believe that uh, that those things favor multifamily and mobile home parks. One thing that's crazy too, I should have said this too, uh, 10,000 people a day are turning 65, Matt. And believe it or not, 6,000 of them, 6,000 of the 10,000, about 60% or so have less than 10,000 saved for retirement. Can you imagine that? So, yeah. equi so equity in their home is their salvation. A lot of them can sell their home and they'll go out and buy a mobile home and they'll be able to use the equity in their home. They might be able to buy a used mobile home for ten dollars or $20,000, even less. Mm -hmm. And then they can live with very low expenses, low maintenance. They still get a little yard and a community. They're not stuck in an apartment. And so uh, I think that's really helping mobile home parks. And then believe it or not, in a weird way, COVID is helping because people are realizing, I don't want to be stuffed into this apartment. I would rather have a tiny bit of space. And with a, you know, let's say a $600 a month budget for housing, let's say, um, they can do a mobile home, uh, they, but they really can't afford very many houses. Hmm. Hey. As you may know, majority of Midlands clients obviously are retirement investors. Um, what makes these type of investments really a good idea for IRA funds or you know the retirement funds for investment purposes? I think one thing I like about them is since they're not ground up developments. I mean, of course, self storage can be, but we typically invest in cash flowing investments. These things are they have a so there's there's a thing called the debt service coverage ratio or the debt coverage ratio. And that's a ratio of the net operating income, not including debt payments. It's a ratio of the NOI versus the principal and interest. And so banks like to see 1.25 or 1.30. That's a 25 or 30% margin of safety. Well, um, 
a lot of these assets have a much, much higher debt coverage ratio, you know, 1.5, 1.8. I'm looking at a deal right now that has over 3.0 debt coverage ratio. That means it's rate, the income is enough to pay the debt three times over. And so that's, you know, I love that. And I think that uh, you're, it'd be extremely hard to find multifamily in any place, in any class that has that kind of debt coverage ratio and therefore that kind of margin of safety. So that's one thing I love about it. And I think that, you know, people who their first goal is to preserve their money, at least I hope it is, yeah. in your IRA, uh, that would be a primary concern. Oh, perfect. And uh, I guess any particular thing, digging into what they're investing in, should they be looking out for criteria that should be met, um, certain types of things an investor should look at? Yeah. So I am a big believer in being a smart, passive investor. I don't think it's wise to Google, you know, let's say self-storage syndications and then pick one on a Tuesday and send them the money on Friday. Uh, I think it's really, really important to do a lot of due diligence. And I'm somewhat shocked at how little due diligence some people, a lot of people do before they invest. Uh, that's why my company exists, because we do a whole lot of due diligence on behalf of our investors. Mm -hmm. But I recommend people get on a plane. It's just not that expensive, you know, and go see the asset in person. Go visit the operator in person. Uh, read Brian Burke's book. That's B U R K E. It's a bigger pockets book called the hands off investor. It'll give you all kinds of things you should look for when you invest in any asset. Um, do criminal checks, background checks, see how they talk about their investors, their spouse and their, uh, employees, uh, see how they treat the waiter at a restaurant. I mean, take your time. If you're going to give somebody $50,000 of hard earned money, mm -hmm. dig into the details and dig in especially to the character and integrity of the person you're investing with. No, it makes, makes a lot of sense. Uh, shifting gears a little bit. So when your experience of raising capital through using retirement investors, retirement funds, what has been uh, the easiest things and what are some struggles or difficulties in working with IRA investors? We love IRA investors. <laughs> uh, I don't think we've had any difficulties. I mean, I guess if I had to pick one, you know, it's when an IRA investor hears uh, or they make a decision. Let's say we're we're raising capital and we have a deadline of June 28th last time, for example, and somebody really dawdles a long time and doesn't make a decision till June 26th. <laughs> uh, it might be really hard to get that DOI form filled out and everything processed in time. But no, we love working with retirement investors. Uh, a large percentage of Wellings Capital's investors are in IRAs. Perfect. Anything I shouldn't have or I could have asked you about resistant uh, real estate that's resistant to recession yeah. anything? Um I think you know I think it's really important for people to be looking at you know the first thing they I think should look at is risk and return. You know a lot of people think low risk, low return and that's almost always true. They would also correlate and say high risk, high return. And that's not true at all. Mm -hmm. And we know this, but sometimes we act like we don't. It's high risk, high potential return, and also high potential loss. That's the whole nature of risk. And I, you know, when I, I made my first million and a half dollars at 33, 33 years old. I didn't know the first thing about investing, Matt. And um, I, you know, I burned through a lot of that. I made a lot of mistakes. I, I thought I was an investor. I'm an investor now. And, uh, but the truth is I was a professional speculator. Um, Paul Samuelson, the first Nobel Prize winner in economics from the U.S. said, um, he said, investing should be like watching grass grow or watching paint dry. If you want excitement, take $800 and go to Las Vegas. <laughs> and, you know, I think it's important to realize the difference between investing and speculating. Uh, you know, investing is when your principal's generally safe and you've got a chance to make a return. Speculating is when your principal is not at all safe 
and you've got a chance to make a return. And it's totally fine to speculate. I mean, Jeff Bezos speculated when he threw his lot in and started selling books out of his garage and it became Amazon. And Bill Gates speculated. And the Stanford professor who gave Google $100,000 that turned into over a billion, pure speculation. Mm -hmm. But these are the reasons we know these stories is because they're the exception, Matt. They're not the norm. The norm is to make money slowly, to guard your downside, to be very, very careful about, you know, not losing money as your top priority. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg asked Warren Buffett, he said, hey, Warren, you know, your strategy is not that hard to follow and understand. Why doesn't everybody do it? And Warren chuckled and said, oh, no, no, nobody wants to get rich this slow. <laughs> well, maybe we should think about that, you know? Yeah. And so that's that's some comments I would add as you consider what you're going to invest in. Perfect. I appreciate your time, Paul, and uh, definitely have you back on for another topic here soon. All right. Thanks, Matt. It's a gr it's great to work with Midland and your team has been amazing. And uh, we always love it when we get a Midland IRA investor because uh, you, you guys make it so easy for us to work with you. And so we really appreciate you. And uh, again, honored to be on the show today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this Midland Pulse session. For questions or for more information on this topic, give us a call at 239-333-1032. We're here to help. You can also access this and other Pulse sessions by visiting www.midlandtrust.com forward slash Pulse.